by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. I watch them grow. They learn much more than I'll ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Yes, I think to myself. What a wonderful world. Okay. Great job. It's always fun when we have guests with us, especially family. Always good. Looks like our computer is rebooting, so hopefully we'll have the slides up for the next song. But good, good morning, morning, everyone. everyone. It's good to see all of you here. Um, um, for, for our announcements, I think Barb's going to start us off with an announcement, and then I'll cover the rest. Good morning. Um, I see a uh, few masks out there, and you'll notice I'm wearing my mask today. I just wanted to talk for a minute um, from the elders. At the elders meeting, we discussed the COVID situation and um, just decided that we should maybe just ask everyone to be cautious. I um, have a niece that actually went to a gathering of 20 friends, and it turns out I just found out that one of the friends had visited her dad who had been struggling with COVID, came to the event. They had all been vaccinated, and six of them um, got COVID. It's just that, that is just what they what call breakthrough cases, I guess. guess. So anyway, if you look at Helena, or the Health Department, department um, you'll, you'll see that, that Helena right, right, right now, now is high high risk. It's like red. So anyway, just to, just for us to be careful with each other and maybe continue distancing, and I don't know how people feel about masks, but um, the, the board will be discussing it at the next board meeting of what to do. Hopefully we can just continue to do what we've been doing. But I just felt um, from the from the elders that we, you know, would have just an announcement that here we go again, maybe let's be careful and just enjoy being able to worship together. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. Yeah, and it's um, the cases have gone up a lot in the last week. And so some of us have decided to mask um, at this point. We haven't had a board meeting or anything. So that's your choice, what you want to do. Um, if, you know, we just encourage it, um, but that's that's totally up to you what you want to do. Um, it's just we want to be careful. And it seems like the cases are starting to surge again with this new variant. So, you know, we all hoped that we were just completely done with all of this, but it's so, so frustrating when it just keeps cycling back around, but that's the reality of our situation, unfortunately. So um, as far as our other announcements, um, some of this, the health department's recommendations um, involved not gathering and things. Um, at this point, we're still planning to do all of these things. Um, we haven't canceled any of our events or anything. Um, so what we have planned um, next week after church is supposed to be the um, anniversary potluck for my one year anniversary. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. I think it'll be really fun. And of course, um, we can take whatever precautions we need to, but um, I think it'll be really cool being able to gather. So um, the church is going to be able to be providing a meat for that. And so if you want to bring a side or dessert or salad or anything else, um, bring that and we'll just have fun together and be together and it should be lovely. Um, and then also another chance to eat together on Thursday, September 23rd. So that's the uh, that's the third Thursday or fourth Thursday? We're saying the fourth Thursday. We're starting up the Just Dinners again. Is it the fourth Thursday? Yeah. 
Fourth Thursday, yeah, okay. I was trying to remember if it was third or fourth, but it's uh, September 23rd will be our first one. It's at 5.30 and it's gonna be at Grub Steak on Lincoln Road. And again, that's um, called Just Dinner. So it's just a time for us to just get together and just have dinner. There's no formal study or agenda or anything like that. It's just a time for fellowship. So September 23rd, we'll be having dinner together. Um, also, we're continuing our study at Perkins every Thursday at 10 a.m., and we are on Chapter 5 of Hebrews now, and so if you want to join us for that study, we would love to have you. Um, we're also thinking about doing an evening session of that on, like, Mondays or Wednesdays, so if you have an interest in um, studying the same study that they study Thursday mornings but you can't come in the morning, we're thinking about opening up an evening session as well. So let me know if there's an interest and then we can kind of see how many people are interested in, in it and if we should start doing that as well. Um, my last announcement. So we do have I camp coming up. That's the intergenerational camp, um, September 3rd through 6th. And the theme is Unplug and Unwind. And you can register um, on the website or if you let Barb Lancaster know, she can get you a registration form and help you fill that out and everything. But it's just a fun little um, time to get away. It's only about an hour from here, but it's um, in the mountains and it's just beautiful. So good thing to keep in mind, September 3rd through 6th. And do we have any other announcements? Anything else? No? Okay. Okay, well then please pray, pray with me. Creator God, guide us as we strive to put away all of the things that divide us and to love one another, for we are members of one another. God, let us not be divided from one another by gender or race or color or politics or any other status, for we are members of one another. God, let us put away lies and anger and stealing and corrupt words, for we are members of one another. God, let us put away bitterness and wrath and clamor and malice, for we are members of one another. Together, help us to speak truth, to labor together, to do what is good and what is just. May we be imitators of you, O oh God. May we live as your children and love as your son Christ loved us. Amen. Put your hand in the 
Good morning. Good morning. Since I don't see any little, little ones out, little ones out, out in the sanctuary, oh, in the sanctuary uh, there with the little chair there. there. Um, so our scripture um, so today, our scripture today, today we, talk we talk about anger, anger and forgiveness, 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 and about love. And one of the things one that came to my mind is my mind sometimes, sometimes, you know, we start with the clean spirit. spirit, right? Right? But we hear but we angry words, words, or words, we use angry words, words, and we start and we start to tear that apart a little bit. Or when, or when someone, someone does something, we uh, tear, tear it apart. apart. And, and we, we can apologize, apologize for some of those things, things right? right? We can try, we can to, try, to, try to mend it, but it's never, never the same. same. So, so I, I caution you all. Be careful with, with your words. words. And, and I would include, include the words we use against ourselves. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for forgiveness. Let's thank you for letting, letting us know, know it's okay, okay to say I'm sorry, sorry and to change our actions. actions. Amen. Amen. Our, our scripture. scripture. Today is from Ephesians 4, chapter, sorry, chapter 4, verse 25 to chapter 5, verse 2. And it says, so then putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another. Tender, Tender hearted for forgiving, forgiving one, one another. another. As God is Christ is you. you. Therefore, be imitators of God, imitators as, beloved of God as beloved and children live in love, and live in love as Christ loved, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Us, a fragrant, a fragrant offering, offering, sacrifice, sacrifice to, God. to God. May the Lord, May the bless, Lord bless the reading and hearing of God's word. So there's, so there's a, good a good chance that, that at some point you heard or sang these words from a classic mid-century hymn. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. If you haven't heard that song before, you've probably at least had that thought cross your mind. If only we could just have peace on earth. If only we could all get along. This is such a common desire that it's become a running joke that beauty pageant contestants will almost always answer world peace when they're asked what they want more than anything. Peace seems to be this thing that we all want, or at least the thing that we claim to want, but peace is also the thing that always just seems right outside of our reach. And partially, that's because it just takes so much work to achieve and maintain peace. This morning, we resume our reading from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians. You may remember from a few weeks ago that the church in Ephesus was dealing with division, like many churches, 
And in that earlier portion of the letter, Paul appealed to the people by begging them to do everything that they could to maintain peace and unity at all costs. If the people in Ephesus had only read that one part of the letter, they, much like ourselves, may have found themselves thinking, okay, so unity, peace, that's a great idea. Who wouldn't want that? We get that we're supposed to work for unity, but how? So in this latter section of the letter, Paul hopes to flesh that out a little bit. He outlines specific characteristics of a community that prioritizes unity, a community that has allowed not only their hearts, but also their behavior to be transformed for the sake of the whole. And much like the words of that old hymn, Paul makes it clear that peace and unity begin with each of us and with the decisions that we make every day. Unity isn't just some abstract concept. Rather, it is actually something well within our grasp. We may not be able to immediately create a state of peace or unity on a global scale, but there are certainly things that we can do to create more harmony in our own personal relationships and within the church. So are peace and unity going to come easily? Well, no. But are they impossible? Well, also no. So in many churches today, there is a strong emphasis placed on um, what you're not to do. So don't do this and never do that and be sure not to do blank or else. And there is little talk about what we actually should do and more focus placed on what we shouldn't. But that's not what we find here today in the scripture. Paul is equally focused on what we should do and not only what we shouldn't. He's essentially saying, Okay, so you say that you want to experience true community. Great. So this is what you're going to have to do to get it. So a lot of the scriptures that we encounter in the Bible can be really, really confusing, right? And while every scripture has some kind of important lesson to teach us, if we're willing to pay attention, some of those scriptures can take a bit more work to understand. Some scriptures need to be read over and over again, and it can take hours of research to really get at the heart of where the author was coming from or to understand the context that the scripture was born out of. But this section of scripture really isn't one of those, so you're in luck. In fact, it's pretty straightforward when you compare it with a lot of other passages. For the past three decades, over 2,000 editions of the Four Dummies guidebooks have been released. These books can guide a person in learning to repair a car, in gaining skills for coding on a computer, and essentially anything else that you can imagine wanting to learn. These are the perfect guides for when all you know is that you don't know anything, right? And maybe you've owned one or two in your lifetime, or maybe you have a few of these four dummies books on your bookshelf at home. Well, I think that Paul could have easily written a best-selling edition if he He lived just a few millenniums later, community building for dummies. He breaks it all down in the simplest terms possible. Paul tells the people of Ephesus to put away falsehood, put away falsehood, and instead speak the truth to our neighbors. So essentially, he's saying, stop lying and making things up. Just tell it like it is. No extra fluff, no omission. Speak the truth. Your neighbors deserve the truth. A prerequisite for building true community, in Paul's opinion at least, is being honest and open with one another. And he follows up these words with an explanation of why that honesty is so essential. He writes, we are members of one another. No one is an island. We don't have a solitary existence. We were made for relationship and community, and we were meant to depend on one another And our own well-being is tied up in the flourishing of others to the extent that when we lie to another person, we're basically just lying to ourselves, right? So none of us can truly thrive without all of us thriving together. And so Paul says that we have to build up those around us and care about their needs just like we care about our own. And one way that we can demonstrate that care is by speaking the truth in love. And Paul goes on to write, be angry, but do not sin. Do not sin. Yikes. That's a pretty high order, I'd say. Well, 
Not necessarily, though, in this instance. I think here he's trying to make it clear that anger is a naturally occurring emotion. We're all going to get mad. We'll, we're all going to get frustrated. That's just normal. And this emotion in and of itself is not where sin happens. Heck, even Jesus got angry at times. The sin occurs when we let that emotion get the best of us. Sin happens only when we let that anger cause us to act out against our neighbors. Paul is saying, okay, be angry. Anger happens, but don't you let it escalate to the point of sin. Don't let your anger boil up to the point where it will manifest in a sinful behavior that will harm the people around you. And Paul next shares a tip for how we can control our anger. So not just don't let it get out of control, but here's how. He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. You've probably heard this saying before, though it may have sounded a bit different. Oftentimes when a young couple is married, countless people will tell them the same bit of advice. Never go to bed angry. Never go to bed angry. And in recent years, scientists have discovered that there's actually more legitimacy to this bit of advice than you might think. Scientists have found evidence to support the idea that negative emotional memories are harder to reverse after a night's sleep. When we sleep, our brains reorganize the way that our negative memories are stored, making it harder to ignore those negative feelings in the future. Basically, as much as we want to let go of negative feelings that we might have towards a person, once we sleep on it, this becomes challenging, not in just an emotional way, but it's actually a, a tangible, physical thing. It's very hard to forgive once you sleep on it. And Paul couldn't have possibly understood all of the science behind this 2,000 years ago, but he certainly recognized the negative effects that could come from not settling a conflict as it arises. The longer we let conflict remain unresolved, the more feelings of resentment and frustration can grow, and the more likely we are to lash out against the person in ways that don't demonstrate a love of our neighbor, in ways that are sinful. And you may have heard the phrase, death by a thousand paper cuts. This expression can also be used to explain tears in our relationships. Most of us know that the most explosive arguments and the most damaging disagreements usually come as a result of really small conflicts and wounds that are left to fester until one day pushing aside our feelings of anger for even one more moment just doesn't feel possible anymore. And like a pressure cooker, we are just ready to explode. We're better off handling our issues now, today, before we do something that we might regret tomorrow. It's basic advice, but it still applies today. And this advice is followed up by the command that thieves must give up stealing. When we think about the fact that this letter was written to those who were already members of the faith community, those who were already Christians, this statement becomes a little bit more interesting. Even among those who were called to be different and who had accepted the call to follow Jesus, well, apparently some of them were still stealing, I guess. <laughs> some of them were still stealing. So in addressing why it is wrong to steal, Paul doesn't just condemn those who steal or cite the commandments handed down from God to Moses or say, stop stealing or you'll go to hell when you die. No, Paul offers a more tangible explanation here. He says we are to stop stealing so that we might start giving. He says, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands so as to have something to share with the needy. The purpose of all of our work and all of the things we have isn't that we might hoard all of our earnings or buy more things for ourselves, but so that we might be able to provide for the needs of those who cannot provide for themselves. Our goal is not more consumption or simply a pure aimless life, but abundant generosity. When we work hard, we can provide not only for our needs, but for the needs of others. And so now, Paul backtracks a little bit to his initial point about putting away falsehood, this time saying, let no evil talk come out of your mouths. Basically, stop gossiping about people and bullying each other. He says, rather than evil talk that destroys community and tears people down, we are to say only that which is useful in building up 
so that our words will give grace to anyone who hears them. Basically, if you don't have something nice to say, keep it to yourself. But if you really need to say it, if you really have to say it, then speak the truth in a loving and constructive way that builds others up. You can do that. And he summarizes all of this by telling us to put away bitterness and wrath and anger and bickering and slander and all forms of ill intent for our neighbors. Instead, be kind to each other and tenderhearted. As forgiven people, we are also called to be forgiving people. We have all experienced God's extravagant forgiveness on a personal level. And so it's only right that we extend that same grace to our neighbors. Who are we to deny to others what's been freely given to us? So if we're able to do all of this, we will become what Paul describes as imitators of God and as beloved children who live and love just like Jesus loves us. By these standards, we can assume that Paul views God as one who is forgiving, as a God who builds us up with affirmation, as a God who can be described who, who cannot be described as bitter or wrathful or angry or petty or unforgiving. Unfortunately, for far too many people, this is the only sort of God they've ever really been introduced to in religious settings, a God who is angry and wrathful and bitter. But I can't help but wonder if this might be part of why it's so easy for us to justify these sorts of toxic behaviors in ourselves. If we determine that God is like that and we reflect God's image, then it must be okay for us also to exhibit those negative qualities. However, once we begin to view God as more loving and understanding and forgiving and encouraging, we realize that we're also called to reflect those same qualities, those positive qualities. Coming to view God in a different way can truly enrich our lives and even improve our, improve our view of ourselves. But it can also complicate things a little bit because it means that we're called to act differently. And many of us aren't prepared to let go of the bitterness, the anger, the grudges, the gossip, the greed, and all of the other things that hold us back from unity and peace, as much as we may claim to want that. As I said earlier, peace is possible and unity is possible, but the problem is that most of us aren't willing to do what it takes to actually obtain these things. It's an unfortunate truth. And this week I found myself um, thinking randomly about one of my favorite movies during my high school years, Friday Night Lights. This movie tells the mostly true story of a West Texas high school football team's journey to the state championship and all of the obstacles they encountered on their way there. And I'll admit, it really doesn't make very much sense that I was so infatuated with this movie. I have no idea why, because I've never had an athletic bone in my body, and I can't begin to tell you anything about the ins and outs of football. But something about this film just spoke to me as a, what, 16-year-old? I don't know. It was a long time ago. Um, but I do remember one scene in particular. Throughout the movie, the coach, who's played by Billy Bob Thornton, he continues to tell the players, be perfect. Be perfect. Almost like Paul's command, do not sin. The coach's demand seems pretty. Possible, to say the least. And that speech in the locker room, I might have cried. I don't know. Sports make me cry. I don't understand it. <laughs> but he says to them, for a long time now, you've been hearing me talk about being perfect. Well, I want you to understand something. To me, being perfect is not about the scoreboard out there. It's not about winning. It's about you and your relationship to yourself and your family and your friends. Being perfect is about being able to look your friends in the eye and know that you didn't let them down because you told them the truth. He tells them that if they can do that, if they can tell the truth and look them in the eye with dignity, then they have achieved perfection. That is how they achieve perfection. It's not on the football field. And so this rousing speech is actually pretty reminiscent of some of Paul's inspiring pep talks and his letters to the early Christian believers. We will never come to be perfect by the standards of the world or entirely without sin. But just as the football players in Friday Night Lights had to practice becoming perfect, 
All the while knowing that perfection seemed like a ridiculous goal to strive for, we too can practice becoming sinless. Doesn't mean we'll always get it right, but it is a spiritual practice. We can practice this by being genuine imitators of God and by seeking to embody the loving characteristics of God. Not so that we'll eventually become perfect, but so that we might more fully love all of those that God has called us to share this life with. Because it's through this selfless love and concern for the good of all that unity, which results in peace, can be obtained and maintained. Peace doesn't always happen through peace treaties and international conferences and white flags of surrender on a battlefield. It happens day by day and moment by moment, each time that we seek to live our lives as God has called us. It happens every time that we choose love over anger, giving rather than taking, kindness rather than bitterness, speaking the truth in love rather than slandering one another selflessness rather than selfishness. So today, as you interact with one another and with the greater world, may you be creators of peace on earth. And may peace begin with each of you. Amen. As we come to our time of prayer, we'll have an opportunity to lift up prayer concerns. Um, I do want to ask that you pray for Susie. Um, Susie's father passed the other day. So it's really a hard loss for her and for the family. Anyone else? If you have anything, I can bring the microphone around to you. Yeah, I'll be there in one second. Second time today. Okay, thank you. I was talking to my uh, niece, uh, Laura, in the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in the, uh, my brother's daughter, Chris Lawson. She lives in Laura. Yeah. Yeah. And, and her husband, Ray, is a diabetic. Uh, his liver is failing, and he's been in and out of the hospital. Now for the last couple of weeks, and when they go to see the doctor, they say go to the ER. So they go to the ER to wait five to six hours before they can go in to see the doctor. Then they send it back home, and then it goes back and then it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So we just say prayers for Greg. Um, the doctor says six, six months to a year. He has one, but uh, he's been a wonderful husband. So we just pray for him. Well done, everyone who loves Anyone else? Anything in particular? Yeah. I think prayers for my staff, Jordan, Jordan Shapiro. She lost her grandmother Saturday morning. She got a call from her mother in Virginia. She was working with me and got a call and her grandmother passed away. So I think that prayers for my staff and her family. Anyone else? Anything else? Again, the unfortunate COVID that are arriving locally, so thanks for anyone who's been affected by that and anyone who's uh, still being affected by all those poor fires and things. Hopefully, we've had yesterday was pretty clear and beautiful, so that was nice. But um, I'm sure they'll come back around, unfortunately. So continue praying about that and praying for the the firefighters and all those working to put all of that out across the whole West. Anything else? Okay. Well, if there are no other prayer requests, then please join me in prayer. Oh, creator God, whose message to us has always been that our relationship to you is inextricably connected to how we treat our siblings those we have been given to share this earth and life with. Touch us today with your powerful and transformative love. Wean us from our tendency to pour hot coals on our anger rather than cooling waters of forgiveness. Wean us from our tendency to take advantage of others for our own personal gain. Wean us from negativity and from becoming bitter 
whether or not we think we are justified in our feelings. Wean us from the all too human and common tendency to gossip about our neighbors or to slander them in any way. Wean us from carrying malice in our hearts and from giving in to anything that might poison our relationships with others. Give us a consistent kindness and compassion for others. Keep us always tenderhearted, even when the world delivers difficult blows and setbacks. Teach us once again about your redeeming grace so that we might learn, however slowly and however how to forgive others also who are suffering or hurting from any kind of affliction in any way keep them in your gracious care and insofar as we are able use us to make their burdens lighter be with those who war and who are victims of war and grant us a peaceful world where unity is the language we speak and peace is the goal that we always seek. We ask all of this in your name, or this, your son's name, Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory Amen. This scripture has, I think, never felt more real to me than it does today. Truth. Truth is a hard thing for some people. It's a hard thing for us to share when we're the ones at fault. It's a hard thing to receive. 
Yesterday, as I was sitting up in my little office that I've set up upstairs, I was participating in our disciples' virtual gathering and experiencing some frustration around that. Their technology was having some struggles. And my phone rang. And the voice on the other end of the line said, this is dispatch. And I got my first call to the scene of a death. And I watched agencies that I know to be siloed most of the time rally around in tragedy with this complete sense of calm and purpose and understanding. And they work together like a well-oiled machine. And I found myself thinking about this scripture and saying, why does it take tragedy to get us there? Who are we as church that it takes tragedy to get us to speak truth, to get us to be kind, to get us to put all the judgments aside and to just love each other? Who are we as church? This table invites us every week, every day and every moment of our lives. This table invites us to truth both our own and those that we share with each other. And that truth, that truth is love. And I invite all of you to this table where we affirm that all are welcome. Now, as we do every time we gather together in our tradition, we come to this table, this table where all are welcome, and where we do set aside all of our differences, our bitterness, our anger, whatever else holds us back from being we gather at this table yeah. only for the one moment that we have been doing this for we come together despite everything. And we do it in the same way. And we did it in the same way that he did on the last night of his life, last night of his life, my daughter, my best. He took the bread, he took one bread, and once he had given thanks for it, and he said, this is my body, it is this body, it is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. So often as you give it, do this also in remembrance of me. For Christ said that every time that we eat from this loaf of bread or we drink from this cup, we tell the whole world who he is until he comes to with us again. All are welcome at this table. Great mystery. Great mystery. There's so much we don't know of your ways in this world. We have so many questions. But guide us, as you do to these scriptures that remind us that we are called to truth, we are called to forgiveness, and we are called to love every moment of every day with every breath that we take. We are your children. Keep us, guide us, and renew us, and send us out into the world to do your will. Amen. As we come together in thanksgiving, let us pray. Generous God, we thank you for the gifts that you bring to each of us. Our time, our talents, 
ourselves. Help us to work together, to work through our judgments, to find peace and to make peace with one another. Help us to always remember that you are our guide and your son, our greatest teacher. We offer our hearts to you in gratitude for all you have done in our lives and the lives of those around us, whether they know it or not, and whether they know you or not. Amen. Please join us for the final song. Before we launch into that, I'd like to say thanks again to my sisters, Charlene and Mo. Yes, thank you. And the visitors, we have been really busy. We kind of missed that in the 2020. So.